and welcome back to this edition of After Hours AM. I'm your host, Joel Sturgis, right along with me. Eric Olson and... Dr. Clarissa Cole. And we are feverishly trying to get our guest added into this show, but evidently... Well, things... Hey, I have an idea. I got I got a swell idea. What's Let me get started. Idea? Let me get started. Uh, giving you the uh, intro. Sure. And I'll start. I'll start reading that, and uh, we'll go through it. And then, uh, meanwhile, you will connect like the mad engineer that you are. <laughs> I I will do my best. So go ahead. And, and read slow. Oh, righty then. <laughs> slow. We recently had historian and author Marty Andrade on the show presenting his case for the identity of notorious skyjacker D.B. Cooper. Luckily for us, one of the listeners of that episode was another Cooper researcher, Robert Blevins. Blevins has a very different perspective on the case presented in his book, Into the Blast, the true story of D.B. Cooper. Eric, do your thing, man. You mean the thing I've already done? Well, okay, mm-hmm. yeah, you already done it, but we did talk a little bit, and I guess the first question we're out of the gate for you, Robert, is what piqued your interest in this case? I mean, what really got you going to thinking it was someone that wasn't really even on the radar at the time? Well, I uh, read an article about uh, this guy, Kenny Christensen, and uh, I found out he he went, at the time of the hijacking, he was living... Um, Right, right, right next door to my hometown, and uh, so I contacted the the guy who was doing the investigation, a guy named Skip Porteous. He's a private detective in New York, and he had a book. And he, um, want, we were were book publishers, and so I said, well, you know, maybe we'll publish it. When I looked at the book, I told him, well, you've got some pretty good evidence, but uh, you need really to talk to the people that this guy knew best, this Kenny guy, and you haven't done that, so. He kind of recruited me to be the investigator for him. Oh, wow. So you kind of ended up getting thrown into it. And were you skeptical at first? I mean, or did you just not know? And and, and did things kind of unveil as they went? And were you surprised, I guess? Yeah, I'd say, I don't know if I was, I was, uh, his evidence wasn't bad. We weren't the first people to investigate. Uh, Mr. Christensen, that was kind of done by Jeffrey Gray, the author Jeffrey Gray. He did an article in 07 Mm -hmm. uh, for the New York Magazine. And, uh, well, yeah, I think at first I was a little skeptical, but when I went on the road and started talking to these people, Kenny knew it, it became pretty apparent to me uh, that some of these people were trying to hide things. Well, you you know, exactly. Now, Kenny Christensen, the man in question, he was a flight attendant for Northwest Mm -hmm. Airlines for what nearly 30 years uh, uh yeah yeah he was off and on he had some other jobs he took uh well at first he was a laborer on uh, Shemya Island in Alaska in the Aleutians for the airline he stayed on the island for four years I, I can hardly believe that the usual tour was about 18 months uh he's fueling planes you know oiling them stuff like that cleaning up the garbage uh with his uh, buddy his boss Bernie Geestman and then he quit and he went to, he got a job, um, he got recruited for a job down near what they call Bikini Island uh, less than a year after they did the biggest hydrogen bomb test there. And he was a telephone operator for the, about six months. And then he came back to Seattle and he re-upped with the Northwest. And from, yeah, from then on he was a, a purser for them. Sort of a head. You know. Huh. Interesting. So he had inside knowledge of how everything worked. Yeah, he did. Um, that doesn't make him the hijacker, though. I mean, his letters home are pretty re- revealing, though. I mean, after uh, not long before the actual hijacking, he was still writing letters back to Minnesota. Uh, I'm broke. I'm thinking about giving it up, coming home. I'm eating the peanut butter from my jar now, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. The airline was paying him um, $512 a month before taxes uh, in 1970, the year the, the before the hijacking. So he had financial motivation. Yeah, yeah, I think it was financial, yeah. Now, has anyone ever thought that maybe D.B. Cooper had an accomplice on the inside? Yeah, I mean, that maybe it wasn't one, but there was two. Well, we, we do believe uh, we do believe Bernie Giesman uh, was his accomplice, uh, a friend of his um they they worked together. Usually, Geisman was um, going to be his was his boss. And okay, okay. It's kind of yeah. 
Because I've always thought that, even during the other shows, I was thinking, you know, for one guy to pull this off, uh, you know, having someone, a flight attendant or someone on that plane that was part of it would have made it more plausible and feasible to get away with it, you know, because everything would have been set up properly for this guy. It wouldn't have been something where, you know, was one of these spur of the moment kind of things or or just a passenger where it was more of a, a collaborative effort. You know, it's possible that, that it went down like that. We don't really know. I, I would say, I don't know, I think he probably acted alone, except for, I, well, we actually have a pretty good theory on how they actually pulled it off, you know, pretty much from start to finish. And just from uh, family member witnesses and things like that and the evidence we could find. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can you walk us through that? I mean, we know there's some aspects of it that you're having to uh, retain uh, for this film, and congratulations on that, by the way. That's very, very exciting. We can't wait to see how that turns out. But, um, it, you know, if maybe you could just kind of run us through the gist of the case. I ended up kind of re- basically just reading um, uh, the the uh, highlights of the email, the original email that you sent to me, which you you put it very well, very succinctly, very logically. But uh, I'm sure it would be much more interesting to hear, uh, you know, the rundown in your own words. And uh, I'm sure our readers would love to hear that. Okay. Um, Actually, they're just, listeners. We think, uh, we think this, the planning for the hijacking, well, it happened on November 24th, 1971, the day before Thanksgiving. And what we believe uh, from, from the evidence we've been able to gather is that the planning started in the summertime. And it was done up at Bernie Giesman's house in mm-hmm. Bonnie Lake, Washington. Uh, Kenny Christensen lived in a little apartment down just down the hill in a town called Sumner. Uh, what we and we think that the the bomb was probably a phony and it was built in a shed out back of Mr. Giesman's place. Now, a lot of this stuff didn't come to light during our initial investigation, but what happened was in January of 2011, um, there was a TV show that came on History Channel called Brad Meltzer's Decoded. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah, I saw that episode. I, oh, you I, did? I, yeah. yeah. Well, the last guest on the show was Mr. Giesman, and they had gotten him into a motel room, and they're, you know, they're asking him questions, and he hadn't even told his family he was going to be on the show, and <laughs> and they watched. He didn't. He didn't know this, but they watched the show because when they saw the previews come on television, they they didn't show Giesman on the previews, but they showed Kenny. And and some of them knew Kenny. They go, oh look, let's watch, because you know they're going to say Kenny might have been the hijacker. So they watch, and then Uncle Bernie comes on last, and he tells the cast, uh, yeah, Kenny could have been the hijacker. He looks just like him. And some of the people, some of his family members looked at each other and said, wait a minute, weren't Bernie and and Kenny gone for the whole week of the hijacking? They were supposedly camping in that airstream trailer. You know, for a whole week, and everybody go, yeah, that's right, you know, because we were here when the hijacking happened. And so, you know, they knew right away something was wrong if, if Uncle Bernie's tossing Kenny under the bus like that. So what they did was um, they started, they read the book, uh, they watched the TV show again. After about a year, they contacted me, and I showed them the, what we had for the FBI. We met at a restaurant down in Sumner, and that's when the, the niece... Uh, Bernie's niece popped up with uh, she said she walked into a shed two weeks before the hijacking and saw Kenny in there taking filled quarter coin rolls you know the paper rolls yeah. except for they were full and he was using red electrical tape to tape them together in twos like one uh, you know, against the other to make them look, look like dynamite sticks and he was taking wires and putting them on now she was only 13 when she saw this and when she walked in Kenny turned around and said uh, you're not supposed to be in here. Um, you better go. And she didn't really think anything about it for all those years. You know, she's like 58 now, I guess. 59. <laughs> she never thought, well, and, wait a minute. They're putting, they're making mock dynamite. Maybe they're up to no good. Well, no, it was just him in there. Just Kenny. Okay. Uh, she didn't, she didn't really know what he was doing. You know, I mean, you know, he's tape, he's taping these coin rolls. Sure. She's only 13. But when she saw the show, she she looked at her. She has four sons. She goes, oh my god. She goes, when I was a kid, like two weeks before, you know, da da da. And and it came to her, you know. And so she called me up and told me the story. Well, I thought, oh, okay. Well, I can't verify it. Well, okay. Um, then I get a hold of the Cowlitz County. Uh, that's down where they think Cooper actually jumped. The county, Cowlitz County Sheriff's notebook. 
and somebody down there had it. So I got pictures of the pages. You can actually see it on YouTube. And uh, the, the FBI and the sheriff both described the sticks privately. They didn't release this to the public as being wrapped in red plastic or red tape. Nobody knew that. <laughs> the niece says it first, and then about a year later, we found this notebook, and then the testimony from Thomas Manning, the FBI agent in Longview, said the same thing. And we thought, okay, that's way too much for coincidence. Her, her story's got to be true, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, why would she you know, lie or embellish anyway? I mean, she has no reason to. Really, the short version of how we really think it happened, Kenny and Bernie planned it together. Bernie was probably the instigator of the whole thing, I think. Uh, Kenny knew how to jump. Bernie didn't, but uh, probably helped him with some of the details. Mm -hmm. And they got they got in. He, Bernie got in his station wagon, and he drove down to Sumner and picked up Kenny. And then they went down to where the trailer had been parked for about a month down in Oakville. It's, it's kind of like where you would want to be if you were planning on jumping somewhere between Seattle and Portland, but not too far down there. And 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 the Bernie would the next morning Bernie probably drove Kenny to the uh, Portland airport, dropped him off. He gets on and Bernie drives back up north to Oakville to wait. And that's you know, and then the rest is kind of like history. We don't believe that that Cooper when he jumped, he really wanted to jump as far south as he did. We think he was planning on jumping out pretty quick after the plane took off because he wanted them to take off with the stairs down. And they told gotcha. him no. Gotcha. Yeah. So I think he got stuck jumping a little bit further for, farther south and probably took him a day or two to get out of there. Yeah, I, I, I would imagine it. I mean, and, it's a long story. Well, know. yeah, now Kenny now, Christensen, he had yeah. military experience, right, in jumping? Yeah, he was, um, uh, he was, um, he went through some of the toughest training they've ever done for paratroops. Uh, it was when he went in. They were still they were still planning to uh, invade Japan, you know, mm -hmm. just like they did uh, D Day France. You know, they're going to do that to them. But you know, then the A bomb came along and ended all that. But they put these guys through the toughest training that's really ever been done. Uh, he had 270 guys in his unit, and only about 90 of them actually passed. He was one of them. And so he was an expert jumper. I mean, he was an expert uh, para, you know, paratrooper. So, yeah. so the night that would explain why the night jump. He could do that because he was already trained in night jumping. You yeah, know. they did do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean he already had a reference of how to do it and what he was doing. Because a lot of that was one of the things I, I was thinking. Well, why would a novice that's never jumped before choose a night? Well, a to jump, but b to jump at night. I mean, two hard things. One, you're moving really fast a jet. Number two, you don't know where you're landing at night. So that would make a yeah. lot of sense as someone that's already done that and knows the techniques and knows how to do things like that. Yeah. Thoughts or questions, Clarissa? No, I was actually going to ask about that, like how much experience, you know, potentially jumping. But I absolutely believe that, that he didn't mean to jump there or even then necessarily because the plane was delayed for a long time um, when, when he was waiting for um, – parachutes and such and and getting the the rest of the passengers off of the plane um so who knows if he actually meant for it to even be a night jump i mean it i think it, it really went awry there at some point and it, he did really well with what he had but um i mean was there there any evidence that he came back with the money at all <laughs> like did that ever get talked about uh what, what do you mean uh his you family. Mean, I mean, they saw him any after evidence that. of spending yeah. the money. You know. Yeah. Well, when, well, um, when I the first person I talked to was uh, a lady named Don Androsco in interviews, and, and she's Bernie Geisman's sister, the accomplice's sister, right? And I, I, she's a really nice lady. She lives over on Fox Island, a little nice house there. And what she told me was that Kenny lent her $5,000 in cash to help her buy a house. Because right after, in April, the April after the hijacking, um, she, and, she also told me that she and some of her friends thought Kenny was the hijacker at first. Um, they suspected it, but they just kind of put that away because he seems like such a nice guy. You know, she said he seemed like such a nice guy. We just couldn't believe it, but we wondered about it. And uh, they kind of, you know... The sister was actually living with the accomplice, her brother, 
at the at the time of the hijacking she was from minnesota by the way and came out on a divorce she got divorced mm -hmm. in minnesota came to washington was living with the brother at the time of the hijacking and that's where the niece, the niece was one of her kids and so that's how the niece saw kenny in the shed like that it's kind of a complicated story really i <laughs> I think that's why they have to make a movie out of it because, you know, it's just nobody actually admitted to the money. You know, um, I had some problem with that when I questioned, uh, well, except for uh, Don and Drasco who told me about, yeah, I took 5000 from him in April right after the hijacking. Um, and then when she heard about what he might have done, she goes, well, yeah, we thought he was too. And she goes, well, we, I wondered where he got all that money. You know, that's what she said. Well, yeah, I mean, if they're spending money and they have no way to account for where they got the money, you know, it, it, that would definitely make people go, hmm, where did you get that money? And, of course, where that recent skyjacking happened in that area. Yeah, I'm surprised more haven't looked at them harder in that direction. I mean, more people haven't looked harder in that direction of the Christensen connection. Oh, I'm well, surprised about the FBI. Yeah, yeah me too. Me too. Oh, well, yeah. Ralph Himmelsbach, the guy, the first guy to really investigate the case for the FBI, he he said in Jeff Gray's book, if you knew airline people like I do, you'd know that none of them would ever do such a thing. They're heads and shoulders above ordinary Americans. And oh. Arthur, he said that in Jeff Gray's book called Skyjack. And Jeff Gray says uh, there are criminals in the airline business. <laughs> you know, he, they're, they're, they weren't. Um, he thought that was kind of a juvenile attitude. The FBI claimed they investigate employees but the truth is they really never did you know yeah as far as i can tell an order went out to do it but nobody actually uh did anything gotcha gotcha they, the, yeah they, they, the, the next, order was out but it yeah. had no they never followed through with it my, like my caveat though is why would they ask for the ran the ransom so to speak in um american money well I don't know. But that is a funny question. You know, when he asked that. Allegedly, and also like the reference to Dan way. Cooper, too. Dan Cooper is a, you know, French, you know, French comic, a French Canadian comic, mm -hmm. which it seems to, you know, it's just odd to me that there would be these these sort of foreign references. Well, the uh, he didn't seem to have any kind of accent. That's what the witnesses said, you know, and, you know, the funny, you know, one thing that Jeff Gray, I go back to him because uh he he got one thing that nobody else got. He got to look at the original handwritten witness reports. And all these years they were always saying, oh, he looked just like this and he was like this. And the mm -hmm. truth was some of the witnesses, some of them who sat really close to him, uh, were giving really conflicting, uh, you know, reports. Like like one stewardess said, well, he was 5'10 to 6 feet. And one said, I think he was about 6 feet. And the guy sitting right across the aisle from him saw him go to the bathroom a few times and said, "Oh no, he was he he couldn't he was not over like he was five nine tops, you know." And different descriptions on the hair, you know. And all three stewardesses picked different combinations from the FBI's uh, facial identification catalog. And that only came out when his book came out, so it threw a lot of doubt into the actual um, whether the descriptions are really coherent. Gotcha, gotcha. I, I think the ones that came from the sitting witnesses, the passengers, are actually better because the the women were terrified, you know. I mean, afterward, Flo Schaffner, uh, she said some pretty dramatic things, you know, in, in the Skyjack book. Yeah, she not, said, not every you know, day. Yeah, not every day you sit through a Skyjacking. Mm -hmm. She was, you know, they were pretty frightened. I, I well, would imagine. The next guy I interviewed was the accomplice, uh, Bernie Giesman. And I had already talked to his sister, and... It, I didn't tell him at first why I was there. I just said, well, I'm doing an, a, a biography on this guy, Kenny Christensen. You know, mm -hmm. just, I didn't say he was, you know, D.B. Cooper or anything. And he's going on, oh, we were big friends, you know, and we worked on Shemi together. And then we worked at Northwest, you know, at the same time for years. And then I went on to Foss Tugs and all this. And then I, I went on like this for about 15 minutes. And, you know, he said, Kenny was at my wedding. And then he says, uh, why are you here again? And, I, and that's when I told him the truth. And I told him, well, we think Kenny might be D.B. Cooper. And he turned, he was on his front porch. He turned white as a sheet. He, he just looked at me. He just, the blood just drained from his face. And he goes, oh, no, no, Kenny couldn't be the hijacker. No way. And he said, uh, if you want to look at somebody who might have been involved in that, it wasn't me. It was, you should talk to my ex-wife up there, you know, talk to my ex-wife. She lives up in Twist. You know, it's a little town in north central Washington. 
and uh, I, I got to go, you know. And, and he was he was pretty much gone after that. But wow. uh, and I, when I and then I interviewed his ex-wife seven times, and all seven times she admitted to me that yeah, you know, Kenny and Bernie, you know, no, she said Bernie was involved in the hijacking, but oh no, not Kenny, not her friend Kenny. It was she named off. She tried naming off two or three different people that didn't even come close to matching the description. And on the seventh interview, just before that one, she had asked me to go see her friend Helen Jones in Sumner. Yeah. So I did. And uh, Helen Jones told me that uh, uh, she, they were, Kenny and them were supposed to come to Thanksgiving dinner that year of the hijacking. And they didn't, and they didn't show up and that Mrs. Giesman was really upset. Oh, they took off, you know. So she saw Kenny six weeks after the hijacking at the laundromat in Sumner, and he said, "Yeah, I was with uh, I was with Bernie the whole week." And she, she, uh, when she asked him what they were doing, he wouldn't answer. Oh, wow! And, well, that that raised some red flags, now, wouldn't it? Well, yeah. And on the final interview with Mrs. Geesman, she, I, you know, she finally admitted, "Yeah, it was Kenny that was with him." You know, because I said, "Well, look, you know, you sent me to your friend," and she said they were together the whole week. <laughs> and I said, "You've named your husband this is about ten times." as being the accomplice to the hijacking. And, you know, if you admit now that this Kenny was with him, then you're saying Kenny was D.B. Cooper. And she goes, yeah. <laughs> you know, but she was afraid of the FBI, boy. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. It was yeah, hard dragging him. From, you know, and after the last interview, I told her, well, okay, the TV show is coming out in January, and the book is coming out, you know, so you might get some phone calls from media. She uh, she sold her ranch for four hundred and sixty thousand dollars to the Washington State Fish and Game. Told her lawyer in told her I named the lawyer and and the, the bank officer in the report that I made to the FBI. And she told both these guys, "Don't say where I'm going." And she just disappeared, you know. Huh? With the, with this money, yeah. You know. Interesting, interesting. So there's a lot of people kind of involved in this. Yeah, I mean, yes. you know, in a roundabout way, you know. Yeah. The, the, and then, of course, now did uh, Mr. Christensen, did he ever cop to it? Was there ever a point where, because he's no longer here, he's dead. Did he ever say, like, a deathbed or anything? By the way, I was D.B. Cooper. Well, according to the brother, yes. Um, you know, now, people pick on Lyle Christensen a lot. You know, they, they say, oh, he was just looking for a movie deal, and, and he was just trying to cash in and make money. Well... We have his signature on a form for the movie, uh, disallowing him from any, uh, allowing us to tell Kenny's story, and he's not getting a cent, and he signed it off freely. Okay. So that's, hmm. you know, that's not true. But see, when he was trying to get attention to Kenny possibly being D.B. Cooper, he and his family just wanted to know. They just wanted to know the truth. They weren't yeah. looking for, you know. Yeah. No, I wanted to, no monetary yeah. gain. They weren't after not, that. Not a penny. That. Okay. Not a cent. Um. The the only things I really can't discuss is uh, after, uh, in the last two years, um, after Mr. Giesman went undecoded, uh, stuff starts snowballing. Because really, once your family sees you like that and, and you're lying, they're going to start, it's hard to keep secrets, you know, you know what I mean, in family. And so I was able to get two more interviews and I'm getting one more on video, but um, they've already, perv I mean, you, you know they went to Giesman, you know, they, they did, and so... The, the, can, we found out pretty much what happened, and, and yeah. that's we're saving that for the movie. I, I'm not supposed to discuss it, but yeah. And, well, and now is the movie in production or is it pre-production? Where where is that sitting? It's it's in pre-production. Uh, they weren't going to do anything on it until after the Oscars. I was told that. Okay. So, um, yeah, that would that would be cool. And we're, we're talking about wide distribution film. Yeah, I mean, a big budget film, and uh, that will be. That'll be great to get that kind of treatment on this story. Well, it's going to be the first uh, full-length dramatic feature film on hijacking. I know that nobody's ever done one before. Uh, they partnered with another studio to do it. Um, they're a, they're a medium-sized studio, and, and they saw that they were going to have to partner with a bigger one. But you know that's pretty common these days. You know when you see the credits roll for a movie nowadays, they usually show like two or three different companies yeah. at first. Yeah, yeah, it's like that. You know, okay, like gotcha, gotcha. Makes sense. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts or questions, Clarissa, who is our resident expert on the case? 
No, I mean, I'm just excited to see what else, uh, you know, comes out about it. Because I think that, you know, the more information we can get, the better. It's just trying to fit all the pieces together. You know, everybody thinks that they have it solved and it would be great if it kind of, if it, if it did get solved. I mean, that would be amazing. I have to say, this time around, there's something about all of this. The, the, I, I hear the uh, the tumblers clicking into place. This time, for some reason, I could be completely wrong, of course. This sounds pretty close to the to the real McCoy to me. This this seems to fit. Oh, I I am absolutely hated by other DB Cooper investigators. I mean, there's no doubt of it. They, they actually got one of our websites shut down once that we had going. You know, the message board, discussion board, you know, forum on the case and. Yeah. Uh, Mostly those guys hang out at a place called the dbcooperforum.com, you know, and they have a lot of good information there. They do, but they do sometimes play dirty tricks and tell lies about people. And I'm their favorite target. There's no doubt. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, because, I mean, Christensen is not necessarily the favorite suspect, right? Well, I used to think it was Richard McCoy. Mm. You know, I, I tell people you have to be there and talk to these people, you know, and when people start lying... You know, that kind of makes me mad. Now I'm going to find out why and what they're trying to hide. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know, there were so many suspects, but you're right. I mean, this is looking into his background. Uh, of course, Mr. Christensen's, it would make sense given his background, his experience, access. There's a lot of things that kind of come together. Uh, a lot of people, of course, you know, Christensen then uh, was another one. William Gossett, I've heard his name thrown around. Mm -hmm. But quite honestly, like you said, he is the only one on this list that has a, the experience, the 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 hard and fast experience of a trained paratrooper from an elite school. Well, that's true, you know. But there's a there's a lot more to it than that because he didn't um, he hadn't jumped in some years, you know, when the hijacking occurred. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I, we tell people this, you know. You can go to adventurebooksofseattle.com, right? And right there on the, there's on the homepage and on the D.B. Cooper info page, you can download the same 52-page illustrated report with pictures and the documents. It's a PDF, the exact same one, no redactions. It's got everybody's names and everything in there. And the same thing we sent to the FBI in 2015. You know, and I, I kind of wonder... You know, we send this to them in 2015, and they say, "Okay, well, we may, you know, we look into all this stuff." And then the very next year, they close the case. And, you know, I forgot to tell you one of the biggest things. I I, I don't know how I missed this, but last year, um, we we got onto very good evidence that uh, a senior FBI agent named John Jarvis, he works out of D.C. in Quantico. He's, he's in behavioral profiling, and we have three solid witnesses. I mean, these people are solid. They have security clearances, you know, everything. They work for the government, and they all came forward to us and said that John Jarvis told them less than a month after the FBI closed the case, he told them this at a ball game. They all went to a ball game, Washington Nationals ball game. It's on a, I have it on a WordPress article with his picture and everything. He told them the reason the FBI closed the case was because they knew the identity of the hijacker, that the hijacker was dead anyway, and it was Kenny Christensen. And, you know, he just wow. told them this. Yeah, He's yeah. a 15-year veteran of the FBI, 15-year veteran. You know, and that evidence is hard to ignore. I, I just, you know. That would uh, be hard to ignore. And then, of course, yeah. you know, right now, I do not believe that there's a statute of limitations on the D.B. Cooper case. So if they did find somebody, they could actually be, should they be alive, I mean, Aside from the suspect that seems to be the most credible at the moment, but aside from him, if they're still alive, they can be prosecuted. Am I correct? Um, only the hijacker himself. Um, the statute was due to run out. In, in, back in those days, air piracy was only five years. And so when it came up in 1976, two, at the very last minute, two FBI agents ran to Portland and got in front of a judge, a federal judge, and got what's called the John Doe warrant on him. But it, the, the judge doesn't really like bypassing the constitution like that so what he did was he restricted it just to the hijacker so any accomplices would be free and clear but the hijacker himself could possibly be prosecuted so wow so if you were if any of our listeners had anything to do with it man get a hold of us you have nothing yeah. to fear you can come forward 
Well, I don't know what they would do. You know, well, Kenny's dead though, so I don't know if he was the guy. Then you know, maybe maybe you know John Jarvis. Uh, maybe he was doing more than just making up stuff. You know, true, true, very the true. Way, the, yeah, Troy Bentz is the guy's name who came forward. Uh, we did make that public after a while. I kept it secret for about a year. But I told Bentz, I said, you know, sooner or later I'm going to have to release your name. You can't put out evidence like this and name where you work and where your friends work and your security clearances and these jobs you do for the government and then say the stuff. And then, you know, it's going to break sooner or later. So I waited about a year and then I put it into a WordPress article. Um. I, I believe it's true. I do. Yeah, I just wonder why the FBI has not been. You know, I mean, it just it was like they lost interest in it. They they didn't want to pursue it any further. Yeah, I think that could be, or maybe it's possible they did check out the report and find out maybe Kenny was the guy and decided to close the case because we sent it to him in uh, when was it June of 2015 and they closed the case in July of the next year. Huh. I, I found that really coincidental. That that is seems uh, to be very coincidental. Yeah, and uh, Troy Bentz came forward in August of twenty sixteen. Yeah, twenty sixteen. Okay, okay. So people are admitting. I mean, they're coming forward, and and of mm -hmm. course the FBI seems to know. I mean, at, at least uh, that that's what you've heard and and you've talked about with them is they seem to know and they really believe it's this Christensen, and of course Christensen's no longer with us. And you're right. Why put resources into a dead man? Yeah, what, how, what, how it happened was uh, Benz was with two of his friends uh, from work, and they, they were going to go to a ball game, you know, carpool. And along the way, they picked up this Agent Jarvis, and, you know, Agent Jarvis wasn't a friend of Benz's. He was a friend of another one of the other friends. So they're all driving to the game, and, um, he, you know, the, the Agent Jarvis is saying, well, I used to work homicides a lot, you know, and he talked about a couple of cases he did, and. And Ben said, just out of coincidence, had read the book, you know, Into the Blast. He read it, and he said, he said, yeah, well, I heard you guys closed the D.B. Cooper case last month. And and uh, that's when Ben just, just told him, well, yeah, yeah. this is why. I guess, you know, I think he felt safe about it because he knew all other three men had security clearances. But sure. the government just figured it, you know, well, you know, we're all buddies here. You're not going to say anything. Exactly. That, that very well could be the case. You know what I mean? They're all together and they're talking shop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That that makes sense. I mean, that's why he'd be so cavalier about it and so eased back because they're all the same stature in the in the um, FBI, so they could talk openly. Yeah. We also discounted some of the stuff that was thought about Kenny early on. Like, one of the big things is people said, oh, he bought his house for cash, you know. that We found out that, well, we had some help in that. Um, but he didn't actually do that. But what he did was even more interesting. He he put he assumed half the mortgage. He assumed half of the cost of the house on a mortgage from Sea First Bank, and those are the mm -hmm. same people that paid off the hijacking ransom, C uh, Seattle First National Bank. And then the other half, he took a promissory note with the owners, Ann and Joe Grimes, and the Grimes. The Grimes were best friends with the accomplice Bernie Geisman. So what we figure is that. Uh, Geisman approached the Grimes and said, "Oh, I have a friend Kenny. He's in the airline business, you know, and he makes good money, and he he wants a house. And yeah, you can trust him for you know half the money on this house." And they they did. They signed a promissory note. Well, Kenny didn't, as far as we knew, didn't have the money to pay off seventy five hundred dollar promissory note. Mm -hmm. So what we figured he did, he just paid it off with some of the ransom money. Mm -hmm. And then he stretched out the other half to $7,500. He stretched it out on a mortgage for 19 years. And we think he did that to avoid suspicion. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's, he was rather kind of remarkably disciplined. And I think that's part of why he got away with it, at least until now. Did you, did you get, did, when you guys saw the Decoded show, did you see where um, Scott Roll, one of the cast members, found that hiding spot in the attic? I yeah. actually have the cover. I actually have yes. the cover for that. They gave it to me. Wow. They did a they did the infrared on Kenny's old house, found a cold spot in the attic and went up there. And somebody had taken, you know, the ceiling joists, you know, they're like about what, eighteen inches apart running yeah. the length of the house. Somebody had taken two two by six boards and nailed them crossways between the joists and made a box. It was right above Kenny's bedroom. And then they took a piece of the old countertop. Kenny had ripped out the countertops when he moved into the house. And he cut it to size kind of roughly 
and put it on top and then cover it insulation over it. And we think that's where you actually hit the money. You know, didn't some kid, though, find some of the money, like, near a river? Oh, yeah. The mm -hmm. Tina Bar. Yeah. yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so they didn't get all Brian. the money. I mean, there must have been a mishap somewhere in the jump where some of the money went went flying. Or well, they did it on purpose. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. They could, they could have done it on purpose. It looks like the money went, like some of the money somehow went into the water. It, you know, there's been a lot of, that money actually, uh, it actually asks more questions than, than it really answers. I mean, because some people think, oh, well, the plane was flying over Tina Bar, you know, but the FBI says, no, no, no. It was like the flight path is over here. This is, you know, we were tracking it with sure. stage radar. We had jets following it. Okay, you know. It's, so it's hard to explain how the money <laughs> ended up on the banks of the Columbia, at least eight miles off the flight path. You know, yeah, it did, three bundles found together. You know, and they were single bundles of about two thousand apiece. So how did three end up in the same exact spot, miles from the flight path and on the Columbia? It's it's a mystery. You know, there's a lot of theories about it. I, I you know, the obvious one they did tests on the money. When they found it, uh, more recently by Tom K, the Citizen Sleuth sure. dot com yep. guys, you know. Yep, we had him and on the they, show. Yeah, yeah. They they said that money wasn't out there for you know nine years. No way, it would have disintegrated. So, my theory is it was done. If it was, I don't think it was an actual plant. I, I just can't explain it, but it's possible that the the hijacker put like three or four bundles of the cash into like a bag or something, maybe, mm -hmm. and threw it into the river, hoping that somebody would find it and think he went into the river. And that this happened after November 76. You know, I've, I've told people, try to imagine if you were Kenny Christensen and you know you found out that the statute's five years and you're waiting and you're waiting. And every time somebody goes like knocks at your door like this, you know, you know, like that, you have to worry. <clears throat> so, <laughs> yeah, that's no way I was going to day, Yeah, that day is coming. And, and, and he was invited to a banquet at just about the same time that this was going to happen. And he didn't go to the banquet either, and it was his 25th anniversary thing. You know, he got a pin and all this stuff. They mailed mm -hmm. it to him. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, imagine that the very last day comes in, and it's all over the news here in the Northwest. Oh, FBI went around the statute, got themselves a John Doe warrant, and now we can look for this guy forever, mm -hmm. right? I mean, wouldn't that would be crushing, I think. Sure. And that might that might motivate somebody to try to throw the FBI off. No, you know? I think it would. Now, yeah. Lyle, his brother... He mm -hmm. he kind of thought uh, Kenny was DB, uh, yeah. You know where he actually stood up and said, "Wait a minute, I, I that I think my brother's DB Cooper." Yeah. After seeing the History Channel documentary. Yeah, uh, Lyle's a pretty good witness, you know, but but he was you know he's a retired postal worker and his approach to a, sort of amateurish. He's a real nice guy though. He really is. But mm -hmm. but but his approach to it, like trying to mail nor Efron, you know, stuff like that was kind of, it, it sort of made him look bad a little bit, you know, as, as a witness, people were just saying, oh, he just wants to cash in, you know, like that. But yeah. Yeah. Huh. I, well, I, I, I've proven that it's not true. But. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, interesting with the brother, you know, I mean, watching the History Channel documentary and going, well, wait a minute, that's my brother, and then standing up and he didn't really have any information that anyone else may or may not have is what you're saying. Yeah, he never told Kenny exactly he was the hijacker. You know, that, that deathbed statement, well, you know, it's sort of ambiguous. But we also know another interesting thing. During our investigation, uh, when Bernie Giesman went on History Channel, he said, I was at Kenny's deathbed, you know, and he was a good friend of mine. He said that to the cast. It's on the show. Yeah. And so I asked about that. And what I found out was he didn't actually go to the go to Kenny's house he actually he just called. He called a couple of two or three days before Kenny died. Um, Kenny was in pretty bad shape by then. You know, he was personal care all the way. He, he was bedridden. Sure. So when he would get a call, they would just hold the phone to his ear. When they told him who it was, he asked for privacy. So he was on the phone with with Giesman for about ten minutes, and it was two days later before he died when he gave his brother, "There's something you should know, but I can't tell you." And what we believe is what happened was when Giesman found out Kenny was dying and his family was there, he called up Kenny and said, are you going to say anything? Because if you do, you're going to get me and Margie, his ex-wife, you know, into trouble. Yeah, everybody is going to yeah, yeah, kind of get in trouble with it. No one wants that to happen. 
And, yeah, and, Giesman, yeah, he's a liar. That guy, he lied to History Channel investigators. He lied to everybody. That's why they wanted him on the show, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, mm. And, and of course, it strikes fear in everybody involved at that mm-hmm. point. Really, the breaking point of the case came uh after the after the Dakota show, because when his family saw him on TV, uh, they started asking questions. You know, and it's a family thing. And they waited a long time to get a hold of me. It was like eighteen months, and mm-hmm. then they finally start emailing me and kind of poking around. Well, what do you know about this? You know, because yeah, we kind of wondered why Uncle Bernie would say those things. Uh, and then we started meeting, and it started snowballing from there. By the time we got to the end. The, I was going to make a big public announcement about the information that we had uh, regarding Giesman's family and what they knew about the hijacking. But, and then that's when the movie people got a hold of me and said uh, they, 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 they wanted to see the report and all this junk. And, um, sure. You know, and then they signed me to a confidential agreement. Okay, you can't say anything about that latest stuff. You can't because yeah. we're going to use that for the movie, okay? You know. And, and Geisman's family knows the movie's coming, and they're they're okay with it. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I would imagine they're. I mean, they're okay with it, but uh, they're after more of information than they are cash, anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. Geisman's family. I I tried to sort of uh, tempt them a couple of times. Like I told them, look, if you tell me everything you know right now, <laughs> you know, I said I can get you in People Magazine. You guys can probably get like twenty five, fifty thousand dollars. They just refused. Wow. No, we don't want any money. You know. Did they ever they say like, why, though? I mean, did they ever? Did they have aversion to money? <laughs> well, no. It's it's sort of a well. They're sort of embarrassed about it, you know. Like it looks like Uncle Bernie was involved in the DB Cooper hijacking, and I don't know. And they're they're not the closest family I ever met, but uh, they're, they're just ordinary folks, really. Huh? I, mean, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, 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 Clarissa. Come on, cash is cash. I, uh, yeah, I, I know, especially if there was no like immediate repercussions. But you know, some people just have that sort of like moral fiber that you don't want to be seen that way. You know. Well, that's yeah. true. I, I don't know. I'd be like, you know, <laughs> cash spends. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'll throw, I'll throw them under the bus. That, I didn't even like them that much. Where's the goods? <laughs> yeah. Well, especially yeah. since nobody was really hurt. You know, people were scared. That's yeah. true. And it was illegal. That's true. But but mm-hmm. no one was hurt. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of a victimless crime. I mean, the only victim would have been, um, you know, what, the bank? No, the, the, I mean, well, really, ultimately, the insurance, the insurance company? Well, the, yeah. it's, I bet the flight attendants were scared, though. I mean, there, yeah. there is the fear that goes with that. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. who knows what, I mean, the first real hijacking ever, you know, oh, scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that is true. That is scary. And and mm-hmm. it also sets a, a dangerous precedent. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, because if this guy could get away with it, I mean, look at all the copycatters that probably tried and failed over the years after DV. Well, they yeah. had to institute stuff, yeah, immediately. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so I mean, I have heard of copycatters out there. Mm-hmm. Since that went down, other people tried it, and well, they got caught. Did, did you know that people used to be so afraid of flying that they used to sell flight insurance in the airport? Really? Oh, that's right. Yeah, I remember so, that. Yeah. So, See you? Yeah, <laughs> vending machines. Yeah, they had vending machines. Machine. That's crazy. It was an event. You you go up there, guy. Right? There was a vending machine yeah. that you could buy insurance through. Like, mm-hmm. I think I'm gonna die. And that's I an event. It's like like life insurance. <laughs> that's so crazy, mm-hmm. though. Wow. I mean, that really instills a lot of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of faith in our friendly skies, and they got an insurance <laughs> machine right there. You know, you might die in this flight. You might want to make sure that your loved ones are taken care of. Yeah. that That well, is... That flying is... was new. <laughs> flying was new, so people were afraid, you know? Well, you know. No, I mean, come on. I don't even think the Wright brothers had one of those hanging around. <laughs> Maybe they should have. <laughs> so the takeaway of this, though, is the movie's coming out, and and of course uh, we're all going to watch it. We can't wait to see the movie when it does come out. But really, once the movie comes out, and and is there going to be maybe posthumously a trial with Kenny Christensen? I've heard of that before. You know, either to clear his name or to convict him. Uh, I mean, after, I mean nothing that would stick or anything, but of course, you you, you know I'm talking about Clarissa, where they'll put, yeah, you know, can. like a mock trial on, so to speak, and present all the evidence, so they so they know a jury could actually 
convict posthumously or not. That's true. I, I, you know, I had never thought of that. They might do that. I, well, I know I can tell you this much. The film company is going to, uh, they're going to name Kenny. They're going to use his name and his yeah. actual, they're going to run his actual, what they're going to do is like, I'm allowed to say some things about when they, how they're going to sort of present the film. They're going to do it as a life story of Kenny, but they're going to keep doing it in flashbacks, you know, like closer to the time of the hijacking. And then they go back to like when he was a kid, you know, or working on Shemya, they're going to go back once in a while like that to sort of build motivation with, you know, showing his life and his career with, with the airline, what might have motivated him to finally say, you know, the hell with this. You know, I've been, I've been with these guys 20 years. I'm making 500 bucks a month before well, taxes. Yeah, he's making. I'm living nothing. in a sleazy little apartment down here in Sumner, you know, and have an old car. I have nothing, you know, and you know, basically that's why we think he did it. But yeah. well, you we know, also think, yeah, working like a dog and eating top ramen every night <laughs> motivates a yeah. lot of people to do a lot of weird things. Yeah, and his job, you know, some people have asked me, well, if he was on the airline at the time, how come other airline employees didn't recognize him? That's a very good question. But on his job, you might only have to fly like twice a month, maybe, if you were lucky. Because that was, that was one of the questions yeah. we had was, well, wait a minute. If he worked there for a long time, wouldn't he thought one of the people would have been like, wait a minute, I know that guy. That's Kenny. Well, he... Um, well, we know we're pretty sure he wore. He had a toupee. Don Androsco and some other witnesses said that Kenny had a toupee that he wore on social occasions, uh, sometimes, but not usually to work. Uh, but the, after the day of the hijacking, they never saw him wear it again. You know, the hijacker supposedly had at least some hair, and we know Kenny was partially bald, so we think he was doing the toupee that that day. Ah, how very fashion forward of him. He also hijacked a domestic flight, and he, he didn't do domestic flights. He only flew out of Seattle maybe twice a month out to okay. the Philippines okay. or Japan. Yeah. Okay, so that would anyway. explain why none of the local crew doing a domestic flight might not recognize him, you know, right off um, the bat. It might also explain why uh, he was really, Cooper was really insistent that none of the flight crew come back. You know, yeah. to come back for any reason, because I was thinking maybe he didn't know who they were. Sure. Or one of them might recognize him. Hey, I got to ask, though, I, I know Dr. Cole brought this up earlier, but why mm -hmm. Dan Cooper? And that's definitely a French-Canadian cartoon, I mean, you know, comic book. Why do you think Dan Cooper, or or was that mistakenly put in by maybe a, a reporter at some point? Well, you know, it's hard to it's hard to figure out. You know, you got Dan Cooper, the comic guy with a parachute. You know, it, it's possible that that... The hijacker took his name from that, and I tried to figure out a way that that would actually associate with Kenny. I really couldn't come up with much, but one thing I know is when when he was on Shemya Island working for those four years, when he first started working for the airline uh, on Shemya, they were getting flights in from Canada, Europe, all over the world that came in. And one of Kenny's jobs, the the radio operator told me at Shemya was that he and Bernie would do maintenance on the planes. They had to clean out, and if they found books or magazines they would take them out and put them in the little library at Shemya because these okay. guys, there was no TV. They didn't really get any radio much out there or anything. So books were about all they had. And I thought, well, you know, it's possible. They had a lot of flights coming in from Canada. Maybe Dan Cooper comic mm -hmm. floated in here or there. You know, I don't know. I can't say for sure. You yeah. Know? Well, you, you know, it was popular, extremely popular at that time, the Dan Cooper yeah. comic. So that, that's mm -hmm. a, a completely plausible. You know, Dr. Yeah. Cole, who do you like for it? I mean, are you a Christian sin believer or where were you at with this? You know, it's funny because I have all these different things floating around in my head, like what I've read about it, what I've heard about it. It's like I honestly feel like I could be convinced in any particular way because I don't know the case as well, you know, as yeah. as people do. I, I would want to be given the entire spate of evidence to look at. I, and I, yeah, I agree. You know, yeah, it's a tough case. It really is. It's it's a total conundrum because there's all these variables that kind of don't seem to fit together in some ways. So I'm interested in seeing something that puts it together for me. As am I. Well, yeah. I get, I get one more interview with the Geisman family and this time I'm going to video it and I'm going to, we're going to release it on the same time the movie comes out. And, um, I can't wait, really, to can, can, talk to them one more time. Can we see this uh, when you release on YouTube, or are you going to release the um, 
the video. Oh, YouTube. YouTube. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. I'm going to put it on YouTube. When it does arrive on YouTube, let us know and we'll direct your listeners to go take a peek at it. When okay. you do do that, we'll, we'll direct them over there to watch it and they can come up with their own conclusions as well. As well, because we have a lot of D.B. Cooper uh, amateur sleuths that listen to the show that, you know, I've heard wild accusations from, you know, uh, Christensen to you name it, even uh, other people that aren't even on the radar, like uh, mm-hmm. just random people. In fact, so random, my mother actually said, hey, I think I knew D.B. Cooper. And I said, what do you mean? She grew up in North Dakota. See, she said she knew a guy that looked just like him that came into money and couldn't explain where he came, where he got it from. Mm. So I don't know. I mean, whether that was D.B. Cooper, I don't know. But it's around that same time frame. Who knows? But this Christensen one, this angle, now that you kind of put it together, makes a lot of sense. Right, Dr. Cole? Oh, definitely. You know, and it's like I like I said, if there's collateral information like a uh, family that can talk about it, I I'm very interested in that. Yeah, I think uh, I think Geisman's family. We need to talk to them just one more time. You know, I think, <laughs> I think so. And plus, yeah. what they're telling you, we don't want any money. I mm-hmm. mean, wow, that's a big X factor, and I mean that actually adds credibility in my eyes because they're obviously not doing it for cash. Yeah, well, Lyle Christensen, when I came to him, with, you know, I told him the movie people want to release so they can use your brother's name and tell his whole story, you know, without having to disguise it or anything. And he, and he didn't, he said, I'll sign. And I, I don't want any money. We don't want any money. I don't need money. He said, I got enough money to live on, uh, you know. Okay. So I sent him the yeah. forms and he signed them. Wow. Now, are they going to be uh, in the movie? Are they going to be any kind of uh, assistance? Like, you know, they'll bring in people for. Uh, you know, uh, for docudramas like this, are, are they going to be what? What am I looking? Consultants to the film for authenticity. Um, for authenticity. On, if I can talk tonight, <laughs> God, it is getting thing. late. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Doctor Cole. <laughs> we tried to. We tried to bring. Uh, we weren't allowed to say the name of the production companies, but uh, they asked me to approach the people. All the all most of the Cooper investors hang out at the dbcooperform dot com. At mm-hmm. one time or another, they're all there, you know. And so, but they hate us so much over here at Adventure Books. I tried to approach them, and they just rejected everything. You know, I offered Bruce Smith, one of the investors, uh, they were going to offer him $15,000 and a book credit and also an associate producer credit in the film just to review 20 to 25 pages of the manuscript for accuracy, the part where Cooper's actually on the plane, what he actually does. I mean, I could do that job, but, but you know, they wanted to bring Bruce in, and... Um, he said, oh, I'll work with them, but you got to have them contact me or I don't want to be involved with you. Okay, fine. You know, I tried that. Yeah, you know. Uh, wow. The, that's it's, it's, The thing about the Cooper case is different from other cases like Jack the Ripper or the Black Dahlia or, or any of the other historical cases is that the people that are involved in it are not very nice sometimes. And they will yeah. play dirty tricks and tell lies about people in order to forward their own agenda. And um, they do this a lot. <laughs> you know, you have to get used to it. But that, it does make it different than when other amateur sleuths investigate the case. There's a lot of jealousy, a lot of, a lot of well, just hate, I think. Yeah, really, really. well, it must make you angry to some extent. You know, like, come on, people, we're all on the same team here. You know, why can't yeah, they, we work together? Yeah, they got to shut down on one website we have because um, they were telling just outright lies about the story on Kenny and everything or just the website and so I started responding to those things over at the other website and the head guy at the dbcooperforum.com went and complained to our server because we used a name or something and they shut us down so I had to start over <laughs> oh man I'm sorry to hear that I mean it sounds like a well, lot of drama for yeah. you know for just to get the truth and and you know and really quite honestly your theories and your thoughts are just as credible as anybody else's and so, oh, they, yeah. you, know, you know, I mean, you have every right to be heard as well. I, I'm kind of surprised, aren't you, Doctor Cole, that they would be that way? I mean, it's just it's like I, kind of. I have know? seen other. I have seen occasionally. I've seen other. Like sometimes ripperologists can get a little bit like that too. So because mm. they ripped apart uh, Patricia Cornwell for her theory because she researched it, put a lot of her own money into it, and then wrote a book about who she believed uh, Jack the Ripper to be, and she thought it was Walter Sickert. Oh, my gosh. People just ripped her apart. Oh, yeah. Speaking of ripping. Yeah, but it was awful. Yeah. That's too bad. Man, that, yeah. you, you know, and 
it would be kind of nice, and here, here, you know, listen to me, go all Pollyanna over here. It'd be nice if we can just work together. You, you know what I mean? And and pool the resources, resources and their own research together. There, once everything's together, uh, you could piece together maybe an even better picture of what took place and, and who it was and everything else. Well, yeah, they. Uh, well, the main problem is is. They they invested so much time and effort and just frankly dirty tricks. Some I can't even tell you, sure. just sure. terrible. Uh, over such a long period of time, going after us, that when the when when we got the movie and they got bypassed, they just went through the roof. I mean, really, and and then they really started pulling out the stuff, you know, on us. But um, yeah, I couldn't work with them. I tried. I really, I almost a year. I kept work trying to yeah. look, guys. You know, why don't you come on board? To the guy you had on last week, Marty Andre was his name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Andre was one of the two people who got offered the fifteen thousand dollars to do that with the script. But uh, now, when he refused, it was different. He said, "Well, I had a problem with the media one time, so I don't really want to do it." Okay, that was fine. You know, Bruce was kind of a different story, but sure, sure. Yeah, he. Well, you know, I don't want to say anything bad about him. No, here. no, absolutely. I, I get where you're coming from, Doctor Cole. It, you know, we're kind of running out of time here. Do you got any final thoughts in your own end? I mean, you know, you've been studying this case for a long time. I, you know, there are just pieces that don't quite fit to me. So I don't know, you know, like yeah. I, I'm always confused by the Dan Cooper reference or the asking for like American money and, and things like that. Um, but I'm open to anything and I, I love delving into it. And until it's like solved and closed, it, it's open. I it's open for debate. I think we're a long way from that or, or maybe we're a little bit closer tonight, though. Maybe we got another, little bit, another piece of the puzzle added. And then, of course, I cannot wait for the movie to come out. And I can't mm, thank yeah. you enough, Robert, for coming on the show and, and talking with us and, and uh, getting through this, of course, and explaining where you're coming from. And quite honestly, I, 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 I opened the show with a skeptical mind. And now I have to say you've really kind of swayed me in the other direction. You really have with, with a lot of your, your evidence that you've mm-hmm. cited. Well, I tell people, you know, sometimes people, I, they tell me they like the book. But you know what? I tell them, don't go to the book. Because when we wrote the book, that was in 2010. This is 2018. We we know a lot more about it. And there are some small mistakes in the book. There are, sure. you know. we. But the real, if you really want to know the story, just download the free PDF report. I mean, there, everything's there. 52 pages, pictures, documents. It's pretty much all there. It's everything that we can say, you know. Yeah. And it's the same thing the the FBI got, you know, in June of 2015. Exactly. exactly. So. Robert, where can they check you out? What What's the best website to send them to? Oh, um, www.adventurebooksofseattle.com. Perfect, guys. Check it all out. All the information's there. Of course, you can reach out if you have more information. I'm sure that Robert would love to hear from you, provided you're not a nut job and you have credible information. <laughs> I'm sure he'd love to talk with you. But until next time, everyone, take care of each other, love each other. And, man, that D.B. Cooper thing, man, it's going to make me think. Thank you for listening to this edition of After Hours AM. And please remember to like us on Facebook and also follow us over on Twitter. Want great pay and lots of perks? Get a $1,000 sign-on bonus when you join our Seattle Verizon retail team. Help connect customers with the perfect products every time. Apply at verizon.com slash retail jobs. Verizon is an equal opportunity employer.